Cool. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome along to uh, a photo speed talk. And uh, let's just introduce everybody who's with us. Uh, firstly, we have Tim from photo speed, who's our technical expert. <laughs> and then our guest today with me and Tim is Jack Lodge from Dorset. Jack, hi, how are you doing? Hi, everyone. How are you doing? You good? We're good. We're good. It's, I mean, yeah. the ones of technology, we have all this, but we're about 20 miles apart from each other. That's mad, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's such a new world, isn't it? It's um. It's been very different, but it's been good. It's been really good, I think. Cool. I mean, the idea of these talks is just for us, for us to catch up with a range of different photographers. And uh, obviously, we're going to talk about printing at some point. And uh, you're, you, you enjoy a lot of printing, and we'll get to that. But we kind of want to dig under the skin a little bit about what motivates photographers and, and their style and their aesthetic and, and how they get out there. So maybe just for anyone who doesn't know, you and your your uh, genre of photography and where you're based. Maybe just give us a little intro, Jack, so we can get a feel for that as well. Yeah, sure. So I'm I'm a landscape. I focus on landscape photography down in Dorset. Um, born and bred over here. Um, lived here all my life. Um, went to university here as well. Um, and yeah, I just kind of got into it almost by accident at university. I got a camera for traveling. Um, started really appreciating street photography, travel photography, architectural photography. And then in 2017, bought a camera and was like, do you know what, I'm gonna combine this with my love for the outdoors and walking and, and just got into landscape photography and I've never looked back. I've loved it ever since. So it's kind of taken over my life. <laughs> it, it tends to do yeah. that, yeah. It does, doesn't <laughs> it? Yeah. <laughs> so you the architecture thing there, um, I'm wondering, because there there's a really great sense of order in your images and balance and composition, very strong. And I'm wondering if that architectural background maybe helped you, and not only from the tech, from the Photoshop mm -hmm. and everything else, but just in terms of composing. So mm -hmm. we're going to see some of your images throughout uh, the chat mm -hmm. uh, today. But do you mm -hmm. think that background has helped you a little bit with clarifying your compositions, perhaps? I think so. And I think the whole architectural and graphic design and visual arty background really helped me when I when I got into photography because my eyes went straight towards composition and light because they're two things that during university, um, I got taught a lot by my tutor to see how light plays on different materials and textures. And, and the same things apply to landscape photography. And I think they're two genres that, that play really well together um, and, and doing architectural work on my day-to-day -day job and then jumping straight into landscapes. It feels really seamless um, and really fun. And it's, it's a really nice combination, I think. It's a very different combination. Um, but then because I do a lot of graphics design and marketing and that kind of aspect um, in, in my day job as well, it, it's really nice to just get out with a camera um, and, mm. and get out, enjoy it, and just think about light composition and, and just get the conditions. I think that's, that's something that I've learned a lot over the last few years. Yeah, and um, maybe we'll get into the the seasonality of, of the classic landscape photography. And I think um, why well, I enjoy looking at your images is um, there's a number of reasons. But I think there's been lots of sort of things changing in photography and there are little trends that come and go. But I, I see your work really as really traditional classic, like beautiful light, beautiful time of day. Um, oh, wow, land, you're too kind. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but yeah. but you're right that light, light <coughs> is everything, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. Tim, Tim, you know as well your photography background. Whatever the type of work we're doing, the, how we control the light is so important, isn't it? As well. Mm. Oh, it's definitely. I think it's um, that's always the key, isn't it? Light. It, it, it kind of if you get a horrible flat picture one day and things like that, but which can be good, but. If you haven't got light like this coming through the trees and things like that, I don't think you'd. It it just wouldn't wouldn't work, would it? It really? makes everything. And for instance, the the story behind this image is a funny one actually, because I was actually driving to work. So <laughs> I, I was driving to work. Camera's always always in the boot as it is. Um, and it was a really foggy morning, and the light just pierced through. And I was like, I got to pull over and get a picture. Um, and, and that was it. It was literally point shoot and done. And then. Unfortunately, two weeks later, these were all taken down and all the trees removed. Um, so this lovely road with these beautiful trees and mist, which is gone. And, and I was like, oh, and I was like, oh, good job I captured that because that's that's gone. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you yeah, get those fleeting moments, can't you, with stuff like that? I mean, mm. I wanted to talk about sort of seasonality a bit with you because mm -hmm. we are both down here. And, and I think one of the great things actually about the UK, all over the UK, but 
potentially some of us get more of certain parts of the year than others, let's say. But the UK generally does have fairly strong seasons. If you compare mm. that to other parts of the world where it tends to just be dry or wet mm, <laughs> um, yeah, in yeah. various stages thereof. So, you know, how important is that to your kind of photographic routine and pattern? You know, do you build certain things around certain times of the year where you know, right, it's it's early spring, I'm going to be out super early for the for whatever it mm -hmm. might be. And, you know, how important is that to your shooting generally? I think it's everything. Um, I quickly discovered in my first year or two, I was shooting. Um, I didn't really understand the seasons in photography. I was just going out to where I fancied. So I might go down to the coast or inland. And then very quickly, I picked up certain locations look 10 times better in certain seasons. Um, and when the sun's in a certain position and that happens and kind of works with the seasons. Um, and I just quickly got into that and started realizing, do you know what, I'm going to plan my shoots around the seasons. And I quickly got into planning autumn and then spring. And they're kind of my two favorite times of year. So I probably spend 50 50 um, in terms of my time actually planning the shoot as I do shooting the shoot. So there's a lot of behind the scenes um, work that goes into it. But it's the bits I really enjoy. Um, I really enjoy actually thinking oh yeah, this is going to look brilliant with the autumn leaves or I'd, I'd love to get this in the winter when there's no leaves. Um, and it's just working out when to go shoot certain locations in certain conditions. So give us actually, so give us a little bit of background then on some of those preparational things. Are you talking about physically kind of walking the zones even out of season and <laughs> having a look or are there things you do on apps? And, you know what I mean? What's some Both. of your kind of prep work? Yeah. Yeah, both. Yeah. So I, I scout a lot. Um, I'm, I'm always driving around. Um, I probably spend more time scouting than I do actually with the camera in my hand. Um, but I really enjoy going out and actually seeing the compositions come to life as the seasons change. Um, I've had that happen a few times in places like Moor Critchell and, and we've got Barry Rings obviously down here with Beach Avenue. And they're, they're literally 10 minute drive from my house. And I love seeing the, the change of the seasons. And my kind of goal as a, as a photographer, as a landscape photographer is to, is to capture them in the different seasons and actually see how they look and how they react to different light and different colors. Um, but I do, a, I do a lot. My, my Google maps is, is, is pinned like crazy. So oh. <laughs> pins are the best thing ever. Cause I'll always be pinning on Google maps and then I'll be looking at TPE and, um, what else do I use? TPE and a lot of weather apps. Um, you kind of have to be a meteorologist as a little bit, don't you, in landscape photography, <laughs> just to understand a little bit of what happens with the weather. Well, I suppose it does get to that point where you can uh, you can have a percentage prediction that you're going to get certain conditions. You know, we can never quite tell, can we? It does always yeah. vary. But I think that's the thing. The point is, you know, when people see the amazing images like we had the, the the yeah. light through the mist etc okay that might have been you were on your way somewhere but you you've always got your eye out and i think yeah. some of the images that we do see like this what differentiates them what people have to kind of get towards is that there's a lot of work that's gone before that and all the mm -hmm. things you don't see mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's that extra time and getting out isn't it that will lead you to these conditions and i think that's one of the major reasons why some images just quote unquote work and others perhaps don't within this sort of genre Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this one's actually a prime example that you've got up now at Moor Critchell. This was peak autumn, and this was actually, was it last year or the year before? I can't entirely remember, but the leaves were just kind of almost at peak, and you've got some real dark oranges you can see in there, and you've still got a little bit of green still that I think worked really well with the ground. Um, and then the fog was just a bonus. I mean, I was keeping an eye on the forecast. I think we had two weeks of on and off fog um, and it was just timing it right for this location because in certain fog it's too much and with a little less the background becomes really busy because there's a house to the middle left and the right hand side is just kind of like an open forest and then if you click over to the other image you'll see it in winter and you'll see the difference oh oh maybe it's in a different order sorry that's all right Love this one, I have to say. We'll come back to this one. Oh, thank you. There is <laughs> one that's more critical. <laughs> there, there we go. It is. So, so that's, that was literally taken um, around New Year's Day this year. Um, and we had hoar frost and fog as well and snow. So everything happened. And I've never seen it in those conditions before. And I just loved being able to see it from autumn to winter. And then hopefully give it a few weeks in spring with the fresh green leaves. And that really excites me. And that's what I love about the seasons and landscapes. Mm. Tim, um, 
Uh, and Jack, sorry, I'm going to come back to kind of talking a little bit about Dorset in a minute because we're both mm -hmm. uh, down here. But mm. Tim, if you can take us back to the autumn one, I just want to kind of link in the, the printing side of things here. And, and bo both mm -hmm. of you, actually, Jack, yeah. I know you've, you've been doing loads of printing recently and you've been through all, and I mean all, uh, yeah. photo speed <laughs> papers. So <laughs> with something like this image, let's talk a little bit about this specific one in printing and Mm -hmm. things to consider maybe from your point of view and from Tim's point of view because color and um, mm -hmm. what we see on our screen and then knowing how that's going to translate into the final print and how you edit and how far you take the edit and maybe a screen edit versus a print edit so mm -hmm. I'm just interested maybe both of you guys maybe Jack just some thoughts from you at the top and then Tim maybe after about technical things you might want to consider when you're dealing with autumn stuff generally but Jack when you came to print this what sort of thing did it work best for you on and were there any things you had to be mindful of when you're in the file you know the print prep stage yeah i mean since i've discovered printing i've been printing for about two years now with good friend andy farrer over in swanage he owns a print studio called fine art incorporated but i got into it myself this year and straight away i had an idea of what papers to use because i've got a few favorites two or three that i really like but actually printing this on several i mean dozens of papers that you guys offer actually made me realize there's so much um, to paper choice and it's so important. It's almost mm. as important as what aperture you use for this picture. You can print it on the right paper or the wrong paper um, and it will make such a big difference. So for this image in particular, I, I love um, NST bright white. So it's 315 grams and you get some fantastic texture. It's a very soft texture um, and it's a, a very clean white color and it works really well with the mist. Um, and the oranges really pop. So I find for my forest work, I love matte textured papers. So your platinum etchings, it's smooth cotton actually looks really good on this because I quote me right, I think it's a little bit warmer than NST. Mm. So it works really well with this as well. Um, but yeah. I kind of tend to use NST a lot for my prints um, unless they're seascapes and then I might use a platinum brighter or something. But yeah. this one really suits a matte textured paper because of all the texture in the leaves. I was going to say instantly, I I would say NST bright white. I think mm -hmm. I'm kind of hesitating. Um, yeah. I always look for paper. I always look at. Um, it's funny. There's not really a technical kind of kind of things I look for. It's more. I I always say when I'm doing a bit of a bit of talk on. Um, choosing papers and things like that it's always the tone of the image as well and what's in it mm -hmm. uh, it's more the white point of the paper for me as well it's quite important texture and white point those are the two things I would I would go for now with, with the trees here that would say texture to me how and something like a platinum etching however the thing that changed my mind to NST bright white is the fog and that mm -hmm. white Point. you want to hold that white point because if that starts to go um if that starts to go a little bit yellow perhaps or just a little bit off white it could it could get lost and the trees could get lost in it mm. as well we want to hold that so i think mm. that that's that's where that i kind of think about um i think it's a bit more instinctive now but i kind of that's if i break it down that's kind of what i'm thinking and i want to hold that white point in there um and that nst bright white would do that as well um, that's a really interesting point isn't it that there's within a, even this image we know okay it's very textured but there are other points of it you yeah. know like tim said there about the mist the road even the grass to some degree the trunks you know there's mm. all these textures in there within the some are soft textures some are hard textures so mm. that's cool i just wanted to touch on that because i thought it's quite neat and maybe we'll talk about that on a couple of other images that might be quite yeah. maybe, maybe the winter yeah. one even tim from from this location. Yeah, um because you know We've, we've talked a bit, Jack, about Dorset. We're both here and we're very lucky in lots of ways. I mean, I wish we yeah. had mountains, but that's a different <laughs> um, And I think you always wish you had the thing you don't have, right? So if you're in the mountains, yeah. you wish you had the sea. And if you're at the sea, you wish you have the trees and all the rest mm. of it. So, do you, I mean, you obviously repeat visit places based a bit on seasonality, like we said. But why do you think yeah. Dorset is such a kind of hot photographic place? Because a lot of people have it up on their list for UK locations, don't they? Yeah, I just honestly think it's if you're getting into landscape photography and you and you love it, it's such a good place because you can drive for an hour and you've got everything. You've got the Jurassic Coast, you've got amazing woodlands, and you can visit them in all the seasons um, and, and get something that you're really going to enjoy. And I just think we're so lucky to be able to visit these places almost on a daily, weekly basis. 
um I, i'll never kind of take it for granted like i was at corf castle uh not yesterday morning the morning before and although i've shot there about 20 times plus i've only seen it in the mist and fog i don't know four or five times and it, even one of those times every time it's completely different and the light's different it's coming from a different direction so I don't think I could ever get bored of, of shooting in Dorset. Obviously, I, I'd love to go to like the Dolomites or Canada and all of these places, but I feel so lucky to have all these areas about half an hour, hour drive. Um, so I think it's so enticing for people to be able to shoot seascapes um, and they could, they may be able to go down to the coast for a sunrise and then go inland to, to somewhere like Babri Rings in the, in the afternoon for some nice light and then do a sunset in a completely different location. So I just think it's a, Gen generally all round great location. That's enough, Jack. We don't want everyone down here, mate. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I haven't spent enough time in Dorset, I don't think. I, I think it's, um, I need to get down, but <laughs> it's not yeah. far from me, so it's, it's fine. So it's <laughs> well, it's it's very. There's lots of different things. I think Jack's mm. absolutely right. That you can do a day of three or four different types of shooting, especially in like autumn and spring, like like Jack says. But maybe let, let's just get back to this image because um, you obviously we saw it in the autumn. We're seeing it now in the winter. So maybe um actually tim i'm going to throw to you first mm. and then and then jack you tell us your experience with the principle but tim what's the first thing you would think either, either paper wise but also things to consider when you're printing images of this ilk with this again it's it's white point again we want to hold we um the white point of the snow i think that that's probably my my first thought in here however for me this is a slightly um, I want to say softer, but that doesn't mean anything against your focus in jazz or anything. <laughs> um, it's just a bit, it's a little bit uh, softer for me, tone, tonally, mm. we say. It doesn't have so that I, warmth either, yeah. Yeah, I think it's just a bit cooler, a bit kind of, it. You, know, you haven't got the, the intensity of, the, say, the leaves at the top there as well, just the branches. And we've got, uh, it seems to me like there is a little bit more mist in here as well. I don't know if that's mm. just me. Yeah, there was a lot more, actually, a lot more fog. Yeah. Please correct me. This is why I'm not a landscape photographer. Please, <laughs> but um, I'm in awe of anyone who takes these pictures. Um, but um, so for me, I would um, I'd probably move a little bit away from NST Bright White in this one, um, and probably over to something like a smooth cotton, which is probably it's quite a high white point. It's, it's perhaps a tiny little bit warmer than NST Bright White, perhaps. However. It will just it it just have a, has a little bit of a softer finish to it because of the cotton nature of it. Um, it does. I, I always say it kind of it it sucks the ink a little bit more. So we we do have to treat it treat it with care when we're printing because it can go a little bit too far. However, for snow scenes and things, it's absolutely beautiful. And like a scene like this with the fog and the mist and things in here, I think it would really. Really, really work quite well. And now you're going to tell me what you've actually printed it on, Jack, aren't you? So no, no, you're actually spot on. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I promise we, we did not know that. We, know that <laughs> we didn't talk about it. No, I know it was a brighter, but <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you nailed it. You know, I actually, I actually printed it on NST first. Um, yeah. Then I printed it on platinum etching, and then I pr printed it on smooth cotton, and I, I had them all over in front of me, and the difference in texture and intensity that you get in the snow and the fog is mind blowing, and you don't get that from seeing an image on social media. Um, no, it's not. Like the intensity is probably a good word of what you told. It's not so much. Mm. It, it doesn't lose contrast. It doesn't. Mm -hmm. lose it's still it's still punchy on all these papers but it it yeah. just has this certain feel doesn't it it's kind of it's almost mm -hmm. a little bit indescribable in a way it's kind of this intensity it's kind of just looks a little it's bit that mystical kind of ethereal feel that i think mm. i think you're right smooth cotton works great for that um and yeah no i'm totally with you i, I totally agree so jack mm. just out of interest um sort of finishing up on this but relating it to printing and how you prepare for printing you mm -hmm. mentioned that you tried it on two or three different papers let's say when you settle on the one paper mm -hmm. you, do you do you print a hard proof smaller first for example or do you go straight in at the right at the, the size you want to end it with or you know what i mean what's your process mm -hmm. through soft proof to hard proof i'm interested um, in personally i always go straight in at a three um 
I just feel it makes me feel like I'm in the image a lot more. Um, I know a lot of people will print like three or four different versions, maybe on an A3 sheet, like a little contact sheet. But I don't, I don't feel the image that way. I, it just didn't personally work for me. So I always end up doing probably two to three different um, processed versions printed. And, and when I mean that, I just mean soft proofing. So it might be a slight lift in shadows or it might be a slight curve adjustment. And I'll just put a little mark on each one so I know which one's what when I come to printing. Um, but Photoshop's good for that because I can just put them in layers and go one, two, three. Um, and then I'll just try and match a paper to a print. And I think that's really important. Half the time I end up with NST because I just love it so much. But with some images, I, I will choose something different. It will be unique to that print. Mm -hmm. um, so when I come to sell it, I'm, I'm confident that I know A3, it looks fantastic. I'm really happy with it. And then for all my big work, I can send them to Andy and he can print them out with my exact soft proofing settings, my exact um, profiles and well, match them with his profile, sorry, really? for his custom printers. Um, but I know it's going to come out almost identical to my home printer. Um, so out of interest, what do you, are you on? A, what printer are you on there? So the I'm using a Pro 300. Uh, it's just actually propping up the camera. So I'm <laughs> using a tripod above it. So it's the Pro 300 that I use, um, which I absolutely fell in love with. When they introduced it, I was going to go for a Pro 1000, but it was just a little bit too big for me personally on my desk and home setup. When they brought out the Pro 300 with the smaller cartridges, it was perfect for everything I needed because um, I'm just going to be printing a few times a week. Um, it's, I mean, it's turned out a little bit more than that now, so it could have been more cost effective to go for a Pro 1000. But I use the 300, and then um, all my bigger stuff's done on a Pro 4000. Um, yeah. yeah, over at Andy's. Snap. Yeah. I'm a Pro 300 as well. So, oh, you, oh isn't it fantastic? <laughs> Is because um, you know it's using the same inks, so yeah. it, it just everything's fluid across the range, and I know what the quality is going to be like straight away. They've really, um, I have to say, they've really kind of nailed it with these printers. Not not mm. just Canon. I think I, I, I think Epson have as well with the latest ones. They've kind of, yeah, they've both kind of taken a little step of forward, should we say, mm. what they're doing and things, and they've brought it all up. So yeah. And, um, yeah, I've been really impressed with them all, actually. And the Pro 200, I was I was, I was actually really, really pleasantly surprised with that one. Um, mm -hmm. It's a dye-based machine. I, I tried it with matte papers, and I thought, oh, it's dyes aren't traditionally great with matte, but actually, fantastic. Yeah, um, really good. And, yeah, the Pro 300 is absolutely fantastic. My only niggle is they put small cartridges in it, I have to say. But apart yeah. From that, if they were the same size as the Pro 1000, now I've got into printing myself and I realize the costs <laughs> and what 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 changes the prints. I think, yeah, it would be awesome to have bigger cartridges. Jack, just uh, maybe Tim, you can, maybe just it'd be interesting to walk through a couple of the images. Uh, yeah. I might just ask you a question in the meantime, Jack. A lot of people yeah. kind of get a little bit worried about printing at home. Um, it, there's lots of technical terms and it can feel a little overwhelming, can't it? Um, but you, you seem to have kind of, just gone through all that and got there but can you reassure because i found with that pro 300 especially i would reassure people as long as they have the icc profile uh, and do a little bit of background work you can very easily get stuff off the screen and out the printer to look exactly as it should look i mean i'm shortcutting that a little but you know what i mean it's perfectly doable oh sorry was that aimed at me sorry, sorry yes Jack, sorry, oh, yeah. Sorry, sorry sorry yeah I, yeah i think you're, you're totally right and i think i was a bit nervous i must admit um, when I was reading about the printing and it seemed very daunting but as soon as I got the Pro 300 and the inks put in um, the ink head in I was like okay that's a bit scary trying to put that in and make sure it goes in right as a first timer and then as soon as it goes in I was like this is brilliant and I got my profiles from photo speed that came in like the next day and I literally got printing and with a few um, soft proof edits to each image like this one for instance was a little bump in exposure when I got into Photoshop printed from Photoshop and it came out perfect. I, I couldn't believe it. It was so, I kind of, I panicked about it for so long and I was like, what am I doing? And I was like, do you know what? I'm going to learn this throughout lockdown. And it only took like a week and it really shocked me how easy it is and how rewarding it is. It's probably the most rewarding thing I've done um, and probably the best investment over any lens, over any camera. The, the printings made me see a different side to landscape photography. Has it, has it changed how you shoot and edit? You know, how yeah. you, yeah, can, yeah, big time. 
can you try and articulate how or why? And that's different. Yeah. But yeah, well, I can try. Yeah, this one here is actually a prime example over at Wind Green. This was on New Year's, um, new, the day after New Year's Day. Um, and actually, this was about a week after I got the printer. So it was perfect timing, actually. Um, and I was playing with paper choices. And this one actually features in my winter box set as well because I liked it so much. And it's a, it's a tricky one because I kind of got into landscape photography to kind of share it and bring people along with the journey because I wanted to really embrace that and, and kind of show the world what how lucky we are, especially down here in Dorset. And then when I got into printing, I was like, oh, it, I can actually shoot to print now instead of um, shooting for social media and thinking about how it's going to look on Instagram or on my website or on Facebook. In my head in the field, I'm instantly thinking about paper choices. So on this one, I was thinking, oh, I want to get the textured paper because the ground's really bobbly and um, the, the hoarfrost on the trees I've never seen before, and especially at Wind Green. And then you've got a soft sky. Mm. So I, I ended up using platinum etching because it added even more texture and it made it feel snowy and cold and it was just perfect. So even here, I was thinking about the paper choices. Um, so, Did you ever try a um, like a gloss paper, like a platinum gloss art fiber? Or I haven't. No, I have. I haven't. I've got actually loads of packs of platinum brighter. Maybe I should give them a go on this because I'm just I, for me. It's the blue at the top. I don't know. I don't know for me. Try it. There, there's pop. no right or wrong. This is the beauty, is there? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you mentioned the box sets there, Jack. So this is what happens when you start printing. You you kind of go crazy, right? And you, yeah. you're printing the hell out of everything, and then you're like, yeah. oh. That's a lot of ink. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I think what's nice is, uh, like, Tim uh, runs the handmade book courses, which if you're watching this and you're interested in learning how to do that, just check the Photospeed website. But I think it's nice to find a, an output for it. And, Jack, you've, you've settled on the kind of box set idea. So can you just explain mm -hmm. kind of why that was the next step from, from you know, from the printing generally and, and how you kind of order those and what, you know, why you love doing it, basically? Yeah, well, I, I've been doing prints for a while now, A3, A2, A1. I've even done some big 1.5 metre panoramas. But I've always wanted people to experience prints. And when I got into it and started sharing a lot on Instagram, I was going through, you've probably seen this if you follow me a little bit, I've got a loop. Um, I use that quite a lot and, and to show the detail and texture because you just don't see it um, on, on a phone. And I got into printing these, so I ended up doing um, some box sets because... I just wanted people to feel this uh, and kind of unbox the experience. So you open them up, and these are all done on on platinum etching. I don't know if I can get that to focus. No, no, sure you got it. Yeah, you should be able to see it. But that's actually on platinum etching as well. And then inside of that, we've just got three prints. Um, and I just thought it's really nice for people to either keep them in here because it's an archival presentation box. Um, they can have it as a coffee table book. Well, they can frame them. Um, and I just wanted people to experience prints. And I thought A4 was the perfect size for that. And at the time, I didn't offer any A4 prints because I really like to do A3, A2, and feel like you're walking into the image. Um, so I thought having an A4 is perfect if you want to put it in a frame with a nice mount because maybe it might make a nice trio set. And and then the whole seasons things came along, and I was like, I want to do winter and then spring and then summer and autumn. And, and people can either change them in the frames and use the same frames every season. Um, or kind of collect them and, and do as they wish. So it kind of just came about after I got the printer. Um, I just thought I need to I need to print more because I love it so much. I was like, I need to do some more printing and, and I'll end up using different papers for each season. So I use platinum etching for winter. Um, I may use something different for, for spring. I, I'm not sure. I'll, I'll have a play when I when I choose the images. So that's also another rewarding part of it is choosing the papers. Out of interest, do you find that there's a particular trend for popularity of your prints. So, I mean, this is a, hu a huge topic as well. I wonder wh why people choose certain things. It can be to do with they know the location, warmer mm -hmm. colours, cooler colours. You know what I mean? Have you seen yeah. a particular trend for that? Probably, I, yeah, I'd agree with that. I think because most of my popular images that, that I sell in the bigger in the bigger sizes are probably the warmer images. Um, maybe people have white walls and they want to create a warmer sense of feeling in their lounge or in their bedroom. But when it came to the box sets, I was really surprised because although they're very cold and very snowy, um, they, they seem to be going really well. And I don't know if people are, are looking forward to changing them every season and make them feel like they've got a little bit, because it's probably going to be Dorset. Let's face it, I'm obsessed with shooting in Dorset. Um, maybe they're bringing a little bit of Dorset into their homes and 
I think lockdown has made us all realize what we love and what we thoroughly enjoy. And, and for me, that is landscape photography and being able to print that and, and give it to people that might not be able to get outside, um, might not be able to experience these for themselves. I just love that idea that I can help a little bit. So that's why I've kind of pushed the prints a little bit because I think everyone should experience their work in prints, whether you're the photographer or if you just like photography. Yeah, um, I think it's really important to experience it. I really and, like that idea of the boxes. I think that's just great. It's something. No, thank you. It's something that um, I, I, I picked up when I was um, at university with doing doc, 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 documentary photography and things. So that seems to be that. That's how they present. You have these folded arch boxes, and you scroll across your beautiful black and whites and things like that. And wow. go through. So it's. I think it, it's a really nice way of presenting that as well and um, well it's easy to get detached isn't it through, through everything on the phones and digital media from from mm -hmm. the, ta the tacit feeling of a print so i'm glad you kind of mm -hmm. outlined that jack and when you give it to someone who maybe mm -hmm. hasn't seen it they might know the location especially if they're local and then they see it huge in print it's really cool but uh, just as mm -hmm. we kind of last couple of thoughts right before we just wrap up and we really appreciate you coming on and chatting with us uh, even yeah. though you're only 20 miles away um, <laughs> um so just a, a practical thing first, if you were going to recommend kind of three papers for people that might cover most of their printing at home, if they're doing landscapes, they do a bit of black and white, through the seasons, et cetera, what would be your top three papers to recommend to people Ooh. that can take most images uh, and to choose between them? Oh, okay. I could probably read off three straight away. I would have to go with platinum etching simply because I think you should always experience the texture and the feeling of the tactile print when it's on a paper like that. And it's, it's mesmerizing. It really is. NST bright white is simply my favorite paper. It's the, the white color is perfect. Um, and it works great for all woodland images. And then I'd have to go with platinum brighter. I, th I think, although it's seen a lot as, as for black and white photography for landscape photography, and especially down here in Dorset, where we've got so much, so many wet rocks and coastline, it works fantastic and it makes images pop off the paper and when it's behind a frame you don't get the because people are scared of the reflections and whatnot when it's behind the frame it's fine um yeah. it, it's it's just such a great paper so i think those three would be my go-to's and i'd highly recommend to anyone to use cool and in terms of what's next for you obviously you're you've been getting into printing we know you love dorset you know is there, are there any projects you're working on or is there places you want to get to are you you know you're happy keeping it here in dorset are there places in dorset you probably have never got to or want to get to more mm. what kind of on your radar for the next 12 24 months oh it's huge <laughs> i've been thinking about there's a lot during lockdown there's so many places in dorset i want to visit there's a lot of places i want to discover i want to find some new bluebell woods and i really want to find some more open autumn places that i can shoot um but but yeah i want to travel more i've, I've shot in dorset for four years kind of religiously now actually um i really want to go to the dolomites dolomites is top of my list um vancouver island canada um all these places um i i'd love to go to those places and i think if i can go there this year uh, maybe the start of next year i'd love to do norway as well they're kind of like my three places that for landscape photography i'd love to experience for myself and start kind of delving into as well I told you you were desperate for mountains. That's what happens when well, you Honestly, it's the mountains. <laughs> it's the mountains. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Good stuff. Cool, cool, Jack. Well, that's, uh, we really appreciate you coming on and chatting with us. No, and, thank um, you for having me. It's been a pleasure. The, yeah. If people want yeah. to check out where are you at, jacklodgephotography.co.uk, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, all those things. You know how to find people, everybody. <laughs> um, Tim, any final thoughts just before we wrap up? No, I, I'm just in complete awe of landscape photographers. Like I said before, before we started recording, actually, I, think I said I couldn't. I, I, I'm just, I'm not one of those photographers, and I am just. Um, I can, like I said, I've come from a documentary background kind of thing. So anyone can take these amazing pictures, like yourself. I'm just kind of like. I, I could not do it. So anyway, I'm, so if I want to come down to Dorset, take me out. I would love to learn. So yeah, when lockdown's over. But no, thank you so much for coming <laughs> on. And um, yeah, let's have a challenge. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. <laughs> it sounds really good. <laughs> Tim's very modest. We all need a Tim helping us with our printing, though. I'm going to promise you that he knows everything he needs to know about the printing. Yeah. And, I think anyone needs to go to PhotoSpeed and, and speak to these guys because they've changed yeah. my aspect on landscape photography. 
Because you don't yeah. just get a box of paper, you get me as well. I like to tell people. <laughs> <He's> <laughs> and the profiles. Don't forget the profiles, obviously, in a palette. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Cool, cool. Well, hopefully everyone's enjoyed. You've enjoyed watching that. Check out all of Jack's work. And yeah, the big takeaway is, you know, you've got to work hard to get these landscape shots. You've got to know your area. You've got to enjoy it. You've got to love it. And get printing because it's not, it's not as hard as people might want you to believe it mm -hmm. is. Uh, you can really get on top of it. But cool. We'll wrap it up there. Thanks, Jack. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.